the Arthur J. Holland Program on Ethics and Government was established by Rutgers University to honor one of our distinguished alumni, the longtime mayor of Trenton, who was widely known as a practitioner and proponent of open, responsive, and ethical government. Art Holland served as mayor of Trenton for 26 years between 1959 and 1989. He believed that politics was an honorable profession and always encouraged young people to pursue careers in government service. He was admired nationally as well as in New Jersey and was chosen by his peers to serve as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And I'm happy to have here a, a button that says uh, Holland for mayor, which I don't wear too often, but it's nice to have it here. <laughs> Consistent with his life and with the mission of the Eagleton Institute of Politics, the Arthur J. Holland Program on Ethics in Government seeks to promote transparency and honesty in public affairs and to improve public policy and governmental practices by seeking to replace cynicism and apathy with active citizen awareness and engagement. For Eagleton, the program has special added meaning because two members of the Holland family are graduates of the Eagleton Fellowship Program. Betty Holland, Mayor Holland's wife, was in the first class of Eagleton Fellows in 1958, and one of their children, Matt Holland, was an Eagleton Fellow in 1994. Tonight, we are very pleased that Matt was able to join us along with one of Matt's siblings, Cynthia Holland. Just ask you to stand or wave. <laughs> but th <laughs> and I'd like to thank you and, and your entire family for your commitment to this program and to Rutgers University. At a time when the political system seems to be doing all it can to push away any potential friends, the Holland's contributions are all the more important and valuable. Our speaker for this year's Holland program has a long and somewhat unusual record of public service. Born and raised in Pennsylvania, Joe Sestak served in the U.S. Navy for 31 years. He attained the rank of three-star admiral and led a series of operational commands at sea culminating in command of an aircraft carrier battle group during combat op operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. He served as President Clinton's Director for Defense Policy in the National Security Council, as head of the Navy's anti-terrorism unit, and as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations. In his spare time during those years, Admiral Sestak also earned a Master's in Public Administration and a PhD in Political Economy and Government. Sestak entered electoral politics in 2006 and in his first race defeated a 10-term ten, a incumbent to become a member of the U.S. House of Representatives representing Pennsylvania's 7th District, a suburb, suburban district outside Philadelphia. He served on the Armed Services Committee, the Education and Labor Committee, and as Vice Chair of the Small Business Committee. After being re-elected to a second term in 2008, Sestak then ran for the U.S. Senate in 2010, winning an upset victory in the primary, but ultimately losing in November to Republican Pat Toomey in what turned out to be a very difficult year for Democrats across the country. Today, Joe Sestak is Distinguished Practice Professor at Carnegie Mellon University. The courses he teaches examine relationships between ethics and leadership in politics and government and challenge his students to envision a viable political platform to restore the American dream. The title he has chosen for his talk this evening is Leadership for a Better America. It's my honor to present Joe Sestak. Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, John, thanks uh, for inviting me and for the kind introduction. Uh, Ruth Mendel, I hope she hasn't left yet. She's heard me speak before, so. But uh, I want to thank her for having me. Thanks, Ruth, very, very much. I'm very appreciative. But before I continue, I want to say um, to uh, Randy, where's Randy? Schmerlowski, I pronounced it correctly. And Liz um, Zoller, I want to say thanks to you. Uh, you made the coordination of this so simple. You know, in the military, we say amateurs do tactics. Experts do logistics. Uh, you're both experts. Thanks for making it easy for me. And then it was a pleasure, um, Cynthia and Matt, to meet the two children of whom this uh, event and the program is named after. 
We had an opportunity to talk. And for those who ever have an opportunity to read about Mayor Holland should. When I read about him, I was reminded of what an African-American uh, minister said to me and when I was going around campaigning, I stopped by his congregation. And he told me what he thought the definition of a good public servant, a good elected official was, which was when you, your acts speak so loudly that I cannot actually hear what you say. And that's who your father was. His deeds of keeping that door open so people knew they could come into a transparent, open governance of a body. The fact that he moved his family into a racially charged environment. He was a man of deeds, not just intentions. And that's actually what I would like to speak about this evening. It's an honor to be here. It is a great school. I know it's going to be a wonderful audience. And I've got a terrific topic that I've wanted to speak about. Leadership, leadership for a better America. I've always looked at America as this great quilt, composed of all these diverse patches, where leadership stitches carefully, bonding together all those patches so the whole is greater than the parts. And then I got to live for 31 years in one of those patches, getting to observe and learn about leadership in the United States Navy, because the youth from across America, from all those other patches would come to us. And we got to mold them into one common mission to serve the whole of that cloth of America. I got to see the youth of America, so many of them, when they were about to embark on their American dream, when leadership could be most critical. So come on with me for a moment. Onto an aircraft carrier at sea. There's 5,000 sailors on that aircraft carrier. Their average age, 19 and a half. They run a nuclear reactor that powers that small city at sea. They're the young mechanic that fixes your plane before you get in, and the pilot before they strap themselves in, never even ask them a question. Just before they're catapulted, hurled by that great slingshot into the night, you just turn to that young enlisted fellow, salute him, knowing that that warplane is going to work darn well. That's why I'm a big believer in the youth of America. I lived, I worked with them. I went to war with them. And as you'll hear me talk about tonight, I learned leadership from them. And then I got a second great opportunity to observe leadership for the whole of that quilt of America as a US congressman, and then as a candidate for the United States Senate in Pennsylvania. I got to go to all those patches from whence those youth who had come into the Navy had come from. I got to go back and sit in their congregations. I got to see them at their veterans post, in their small businesses. I got to see them in their labor forces, whether it was a medical profession that was repairing somebody's body, whether it was an educator that was pouring knowledge in to the brain of one, some new youth coming up or whether it was a first responder that was protecting their fellow citizen. And then I got to see those who were less fortunate, the homeless, the incarcerated. I got to go to so many of the homes of Americans in all these various patches. Got to see their hopes, their dreams, their ideals, but I'll never forget one particular patch, Potter County. It's on the northern tier of Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful rural community. And when you drive in, it has this great big large sign that says, Welcome to God's Country. Four miles in, I got stopped for speeding. <laughs> but once I got through that speed patch, I had the opportunity to sit down with a farmer. And when I asked him, how's the recession impacting you back then? He looked at me with a wry smile, with a type of wisdom in his eyes that it always seems a farmer has and said, not too bad. I was already hurting. I was already hurting. How had his American dream, and that of so many of his fellow citizens, gone aground? Where was the leadership that might have prevented it? Why was there the absence of leadership that didn't prevent it? 
The Wall Street Journal wrote a wonderful article in answer to that question a number of years ago when it spoke about a tradition of the seas. It spoke about 30 tons of ship that were hurtling towards each other in the middle of the night at, at sea. And when they met, 2,000 tons of ship and 176 men lay on the bottom of the ocean. And then began the cruel business of accountability, where those men who were there had to answer, how did it happen? And whose error was it ca that caused it to happen? The article continued by saying, yes, it is cruel, this business of accountability. Because no matter how deep you might probe after something like that, you can't bring back the dead. Nor can anything probe deeper than the remorse of well-intentioned men. But then the article said, it's doubly cruel. Because almost everywhere else in America, we seem to have abandoned accountability. Leaders seem to say, what's done is done. Why torture men by asking why afterwards? In fact, we seem to have even developed a lexicon of short-term phrases that actually defines this lack of quality in our leadership today. Enron, WMD, AIG, Katrina, the sequester, the debt ceiling, the super committee, the fiscal cliff. To a leader seem to say, don't hold me accountable for what I do or what I don't do. Hold me accountable for my intentions. But then the article said, everywhere, it seems, except on the sea. There, there is a tradition that is older than this country itself, a tradition that with responsibility goes authority, and with them both goes accountability. Because a captain of a ship, like a head of state, is given honor and privilege and trust above all other men on that ship. But let that ship steer a wrong course and touch ground. Or let disaster come to that ship or its crew. crew, crew. Then that captain has to answer for what he did or did not do. For him, there is absolutely no escape. Yes, the article says, this business of accountability is cruel. But the choice is that, or the end of responsibility. And finally, the end of confidence and trust in those who lead. For who would ever have trust in a leader who feels himself beyond accountability for what he did or what he didn't do? And then, once you lose that confidence and trust, once that's gone, then a very purposeful ship begins to disintegrate into chaos. And a ship of state like the America, our country, begins to appear as though it's just going back and forth from crisis to crisis without some type of leadership that carefully stitches, bonds together those disparate patches upon which you can have one common purpose. Accountability, the ordeal of answering for oneself, for one's deeds, not just one's intentions. That is the leadership that is needed for a better America. You know, America has had this type of challenge we have today many times before. But when you look through history, it always appears as though we've had that type of American leadership with a character of accountability seemed to prevail, even on the founding days of our great republic. After the American Revolution, our country faced a very uncertain future. For a while there, we had a period of time that we were under the less than helpful Articles of Confederation. And the officers who had actually led our American Revolution, who had fought to create this great nation of ours, we're so concerned about the lack of cohesion in America and the failure of any types of leadership to fix it that they came to George Washington and besieged him to become an autocratic ruler. They assembled one night and handed him a letter with their request. And George Washington put on his bifocals. Before he read that letter, 
And he looked over at the men assembled there, and he said to them, Not only have I grown old in the service of my country, but I have also grown blind in the service of my country. With those words, the effort by these officers to change out the legitimate government of the United of America stopped because they remembered their accountability for the common enterprise for which they had fought together, one country belonging to all. But there was a second incident that George Washington did that reminded generations of leaders to come about the second great principle upon which our character, our very nation, is founded. And I was reminded about it one time when I was a very young officer in command of my very first ship. We pulled back into a port in Egypt, and a young Egyptian officer, who had been under, underway to observe us, came up to me before he left. And he said, Captain, you are the commanding officer. Yet you treat your enlisted men as though they're equal to you. I assured him that they certainly did give due regard to rank. He said, no, that's not what I mean. You treat your enlisted men as though they are equal human beings to you. We don't. I then told him the story of George Washington, who ingrained in us in the military this concept of equality. When he gave the very first medal ever given in the history of America's army, a small piece of purple ribbon, and declared that it could only be given to an enlisted man, never to an officer, because he wanted to demonstrate that the way to the top in this new American army was going to be open to anyone, no matter your initial status in life just like it was going to be in our new American society. By these two incidents, George Washington told generations of American leaders their accountability for the very unique character upon which our country is founded. And that's a wonderful alliance between rugged individualism and the common enterprise, between equal individual opportunity and the common wealth of our country. Come with eight attack aircraft planes as they took off from the carrier within my carrier battle group one day over to the skies where they went in the skies of Afghanistan. One of those eight pilots that night disregarded orders not to die below 20,000 feet without requesting permission because we just wanted a short opportunity to scan by other means whether the Taliban had weapons that might endanger them if they went any lower. But eight Special Force soldiers had been ambushed. Four had died immediately. And those who were alive just radioed up and said, dive, strafe immediately. Cause confusion so we can get out of here. A young woman pilot, first time overseas, first time over a foreign country, just felt she didn't have time to request permission. She dove three times in the middle of the night to 3,000 feet to strafe. When I joined up during the Vietnam War era, we didn't have women on warships, never mind flying a most advanced combat aircraft in a war. But because she was given her equal individual opportunity to be all she could be, the common enterprise, the common mission, in that small patch of America, the United States Navy performed better that night. And four soldiers picked up their dead and came home. I would like to take you to another dark night down in Washington, D.C., where I got to watch accountability for the leadership of the whole of that quilt. We had been in our district out of Washington, D.C. as Congress members. When Secretary of the Treasury Paulson, in the middle of 2008, got on a conference call and asked us all to be on it, and you could hear the timber in his voice as he said, we have weeks to act. And if we don't, this nation will be in a Great Depression as severe of that, if not worse, than the last century. So we all went down to Washington. And on that night, we assembled. 
And then the first few members of the caucus got up to talk and said, don't touch it. They did it. And we don't want to be held accountable for this mess. I could only think about that woman on another night over Afghanistan, where she was willing, having been given an opportunity to serve, to be accountable for her deed. Not, not at all her intentions. I had no doubt that when she had taken off that night, just like any other pilot, and she turned and saluted that young enlisted fellow who had fixed her plane, confident that plane would work that night in the skies, that when those four men got out of that ambush, they looked up into that skies and gave a very similar salute, confident that they knew somebody would be accountable for them, accountable for the deed, not the intention to do it. But I think it's just not politics. It's just not government. It's just not elected officials. Americans have lost their trust if you travel this country. In so much of the leadership across our great civic spectrum of society, whether it's titans of business or of labor, whether it's civic leaders or experts of all stripes, they have lost it. I can remember visiting last Veterans Day a penitentiary in Pennsylvania so I could see my fellow veterans, many of them who had come home from Vietnam. Some were there from Iraq and Afghanistan. They all had come home, with some of them with collateral damage post-traumatic stress disorder, recessions in all those wars. Without a job, some of them got involved with drugs, caught with thousands of dollars of drug money in their hands. They were understandably held accountable. I thought about them a few months later as I read that the US Assistant Attorney General of the United States of America had decided not to prosecute someone else involved in our drug trade. It was a large bank worth $2.5 trillion, HSBC, a multinational bank where bank officials knowingly laundered hundreds of millions of dollars of the drug cartel, and then worse, laundered hundreds of millions of dollars of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, a US designated terrorist organization. Sometimes, even justice in America seems to have lost its fair accountability, where someone who fights the global war of terror is held more accountable than someone who abets the other side in a global war of terror. But the US Attorney General said there would have been some collateral damage. Other institutions might have pulled their money out. That's why the biggest deficit in America is not the debt. The biggest deficit in America is the trust deficit. But I have great hope and faith that the one true national treasure we have is going to right this issue. I learned most starkly, not just living with, but having heard a wonderful story in the White House, where I worked for President Clinton, about that national treasure. President Clinton one evening had in five men who had landed on the beaches of Normandy and five men who had written about that epic battle that turned the tides of history for our nation and the free world through the prism of time, historians. And one of those men, when he's, it's his turn to speak to the president, said, Mr. President, when the youth of America had landed, Almost all their officers were killed because in the German Teutonic mind, if you cut off the head, the officer corps, the body will collapse, the enlisted. But this gentleman said to the president, little did the Germans understand the character of our American army. There they were, the youth of America, clawing the way into the wet sands of Normandy, trying to hide from the hell that was coming down from above, where the Germans had stationed artillery and dell shell after shell after shell was coming down upon these leaderless men. And then this gentleman said to the president, Mr. President, that's when you saw 
what makes America great. There they were, these 18, 19, 20-year-old youth clawing their ways into the sand. And then they just looked at one another and said, we're going to get the hell off this beach. And by twos and threes and fours, Mr. President, they picked themselves up. They took those bluffs. And then over the following year, they went all the way to Berlin. And then he turned back to the president. And he pointed at him. And he said, Mr. President, don't ever forget that whatever that it is, that it that we somehow instill in the youth of America, that, Mr. President, is the national treasure you must most cherish. I lived with that national treasure for 31 years. That's why I'm teaching, to be with that treasure, the youth of America. Go back on board one last time that aircraft carrier. Even tonight, a young man or woman is demonstrating exactly what Washington, D.C., and so many other leaders should learn again. That pilot, just before she or he turns and gives that salute. Sometimes it's told, stop, get out. We got to change out your plane. But before that pilot will shut off their engine, they want to make sure they've been unbuckled from that catapult. You shut off your engines and suddenly some mistake is made and that catapult goes off and your engines aren't turning, you're not coming back. And so a young 19-year-old enlisted fellow goes under the belly of that plane where you can't see, unhooks it from the catapult and walks in front of that plane and stays there till that pilot gets safely on deck. And that young enlisted has said the following, go ahead, trust me, because I am willing not just to be responsible, but also to be held accountable for my deed. And if I made a mistake in doing it, and you start heading overboard to your death, you're going right through me, and I'm going overboard with you to mine. Accountability, the ordeal of answering for oneself, for one's deeds, not one's intentions. Accountable leadership for a better America, our national treasure. I lived with it. I know they are, our youth. Those three together is why America will right this wrong of the lack of accountable leadership. It's exactly what America needs. It is you. Thank you very much. There's any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll take this one, then that one. Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Sestak, if you say that accountability in Washington is going to be restored by the youth of America, and the youth of America is to take up leader positions in, say, Washington, or their, or, uh, their districts, or their states, how do you believe that young people, such as myself, such as my peers, are going to find the resources, are going to find the people to support them and rally around them when there are people in those positions, when there are incumbents in those positions who very like to hold on to those positions. How do you think that those people will be able to overcome the odds and will be able to push through and make a change in those offices? Because so many have. I mean, President Obama was a wet behind the ear two-year senator. He'd been a state senator. And then he's president of the United States. Tell me any legislation he did in that interim time. None. But he made it. Now, I'm not saying he's changed Washington. But your question had to do, can you make it there? Look at Joe Sestak. My district's 55% Republican, 33% Democrat. I'm only the second Democrat since the Civil War. My first race, I had to raise $3.5 million to win it. My second race, I spent $28,000 because I was able to reach across the aisle and say, hey, Senator Specter, I had the president and everybody on down lined up against me. Well, we did it. The Taliban's a pretty tough enemy out there, but those kids do it. In my mind, you know, 
John F. Robert F. Kennedy had it right, don't ask why, ask why not. And I know that's an ideal, but we are the only nation in the history of the world that was ever founded on a principle, not power. Everywhere I went in the world, what I saw was they respected us for the power of our economy, the power of our military, but they admired us for the power of our ideals. And so my mind is, yeah, I think leadership has prostituted those ideals in both parties. As I said, across the whole spectrum, HSBC, the US Attorney General. But I got to tell you, anybody who thinks today's generation isn't tremendous, go out and watch them out there at sea. You know, I came back to an institute of learning, not for the paycheck, because it's pretty small. <laughs> I could have been lobbying or something, all right? To come back and learn from the limb. I'm not kidding you. I told every one of my classes, I'll get more out of this than you will. I think the only thing you have to understand is, yeah, nine out of 10 of you are gonna fail. Okay. But someone's gonna make it and you only need a few titans who are willing to risk their jobs and their careers for doing what's right. And that doesn't mean you don't do principal compromise with the other side. It doesn't mean you bash them up. But Washington, D.C. has come, I must win and you must lose. It's like the banking industry should not be. Every bank wants to be the best bank, the biggest bank, but no bank wants another bank down the street to fail. Because if banks begin failing, even though you're surviving as the biggest, then there's a run on the credit on the banks. Because the banking system's failing. Well, that's what's happened in Washington and other places. We want the other side to fail no matter what, so there's a run on the credibility. Do I think it'd be done? Sure. This President of the United States went to Washington and the Republicans in my district voted for him. It didn't work out quite like people thought, but that doesn't mean it can't be. I'm sorry, I can't tell you how great, but you know, I'm a big believer in the, it can be. We've done it all the time. Yes, I'm sorry, sir, you had a question. And then I'll come right back, miss. Okay. I don't think they can right now. I find to, there's no titans in, tell me who's the titan is in Congress. I mean, by the way, this isn't anything I haven't said on MSNBC or Fox. So, I mean, there's nothing I say here that I wouldn't say anywhere I had to say in public. Is, you know, as I've said in an earlier group, where's the Sam Nunn's of old? You may not totally agree with Sam Nunn, but you know what he stood for. You may not have totally agreed with Ted Kennedy, but you knew what he stood for. Um, my take is that this is a very, my exposure to the youth, and I just mentioned this to you two sitting there, it's a very independent, not cynical, but skeptical youth that are coming up. They've had to learn some lessons, even though they may not realize it fully, consciously yet, that my father had to learn having emigrated from Czechoslovakia here in the middle of the depression trying to survive as a kid. Someone got us into this mess. It was all avoidable. The question is, can a place like this institute actually have a few of those titans come out? I'm a big believer in it. I've watched ships be turned around on a dime with three or four good people showing up. A decent captain, a good chief petty officer, and maybe one department head. Am I wrong? <laughs> it's what it takes. Anybody's here. But if you don't do it, and if you aren't willing to be bashed by your own side in doing it. But I don't think it can be. But I believe, having gone around, the reason we came within two points of winning. Now, if I was smarter, I would have figured it out. I got it. You know, if you don't get in the end zone, who cares? But the gubernatorial candidate lost by 10. Five congressmen was lost by 11. We had the biggest funding gap. But I went to Congress for health care because my daughter had brain cancer. And I wanted to pay back this country by working on it because it had taken care of my daughter in TRICARE. So I did tons of healthcare town halls in the midst of that anger. I actually think it strengthened it because as much as people didn't like it, I thought they, I gained the respect for it. And I think 
That's what has to be done. Could be wrong, but yes. Uh, there was a woman behind you, I think. But, okay, I guess it was you. I'm sorry. The other woman. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Yes. Um, Could you repeat I, the question? Yes, I should be repeating the question. I was told to do that. She says, well, Joe, you talk about accountability, but these people in Congress are being accountable to a very small segment and not to the whole on it, which is why I tried to say that at least my experience has been both in the military and in what I regard a purple state, Pennsylvania, who's had Democrats and Republicans, we had a Republican senator, a Republican governor now, that it's accountability to that rugged individualism. That if you wanted to see it very well understood and brilliantly supported, turn into the Republican convention. I agree. This nation was built on rugged individualism. Our forefathers who came here from England and other places, didn't want the government interfering with them. So they create a government with such checks and balances that we don't want that negative government interfering with us. But as George Washington pointed out, there's this commonwealth. This is coming together. SEAL Team 6 is a damn fine group of rugged individuals. But they understand one another's backs are needed when they go out and do stuff. And so my take on it is turn into parts of the Democratic Convention and the more, you know, entitlements are godly and the common good is good. That's the accountability to having them both in balance that I talk about. I find most people, at least in Pennsylvania, yes, I mean, there's segments. I'm never going to get, you know, more than 30% of the people, 33%. But in my mind, on the whole, the people don't really care if you're more right or you're more left. They just kind of want it to work, and they kind of have a common sense. So when George Bush and Ted Kennedy agree on the immigration bill, why are, you I mean, Ted Kennedy to the left and George Bush over here, how can you not hold your nose and vote for it and put the problem behind us? And so at times you have to rise above your constituency. At times you have to specific representative and, and all. That's what I, and I think, Leadership will be rewarded for that. And number two, leadership is actually showing people that the same sets of facts can be seen through a distant prism. And that's what your job is to get out and explain that to the crew, that the ship has to stay another month at the war because of these facts. Yes, sir. That's the difficulty of it. But, I mean... Do you see that happening? Not with this set of leadership, no. But to his question, as I said very clearly, I think it'll take the next generation to do it. There'll be a few that'll come along perhaps, but no. I mean, take the Simpson-Bowles Commission. I mean, was it perfect? But neither side, neither end of Pennsylvania Avenue embraced it to say, look, it isn't great. Both extremes are not gonna like it, but it's a principal compromise, move on. Yes, sir. Who would you say is a modern day leader from Kennedy on? Well, the last one just left, or, you know, and actually is the person I most liked, respected, and stayed associated with in Congress was Chuck Hagel. He's a Republican. By the way, I said this in 2008 when I was running for my second congressional term, and I was asked, who do you most respect and admire? Competent, honest. Um, candid, willing to upset his own base, willing to lose his job. He won his election by about 80%, but then he said Iraq is wrong, and he was going to lose his job. So you know, there's good people there. But the filibuster, how can you have everything else in America change except in the last 
200 years except the rules of the Senate. And, you know, to my mind is sometimes I told somebody else here, you know, it just gets too comfortable down there. You can survive in your job. That woman could have, as the, some other pilots did, stayed up there and not do, die and put her career, if not her life, as I said, at risk. But that's what you take the position for. Well, that's accountability. What about leadership? Who, who can you look back on and say, this, this person led? Well, I defined accountability as the most significant essence of leadership. If you're, if you're nice, if you're easy, you know, all that's important. But that crew of the ship wanted to know, is that guy going to be with me when this ship goes down? <laughs> is he willing to be held accountable for it? And so that, to me, as I described, is accountable leadership. You know, everybody has their different styles, but, you know, you know, I, I love to watch the students come into my classroom. And I say, okay, next week, make sure that, you know, you bring a copy of your own paper in, you know? And somebody says, well, you know, you didn't remind me the day before. So, I mean, you know, are, it's, a, it's interesting to watch that. But that's accountability. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but, you know, in the essence of it. I wish it was a term that I could better, but, you know, how many times does, have you heard a politician say, we got to tuck, we've got to balance debt by cutting tax expenditures, but not one of them will mention what the specifics are. And we'll continue, but it'll take somebody, I think, to be like that and to win, and that individual will come and more will garner towards it. Yes, yes. You're saying that's what it is today? I believe so, yes. Okay. Who generally have a lack of accountability, a lack of trust, a lack of equality in different opinions and different topics. Do you think that they would hinder the next generation of possible leaders to the point where we may not see someone step up and actually take the reins? Yes, but so what? I mean, the Taliban doesn't exactly make it easy for us to beat them. We don't complain about it. We just figure out a better way to beat the odds and win. And I don't say that mean flippantly. I go on Fox more than I go on MSNBC, frankly, because they ask me hardball questions. I went on Sean Hannity just two, three weeks ago for Women in Combat. I've been on his show at least 15 times. But he'll come on before I go on at times and say, well, Joe, who's going to win now? You know. My take is, yeah, they're that way. Life is unfair, John F. Kennedy said. It's not going to be easy, but my party should have better understood. I had never seen stupid study since I had left high school and I used to have to go to it until I went to the United States Congress. And that summer, after we had had those health care town halls where the Tea Party showed up, and I'd gone to Congress for that bill. I slept with that bill. But two-thirds of the Congress didn't understand that bill. And so they held, as we came back, two, three times a week to go over each section of that bill to explain it to a Congress person. Do you think they were prepared to go up against Fox saying they're going to pull the plug on Granny? So my take is the party sometimes should hand, of each side, should hold the mirror up to itself before saying it's challenging out there. Look, you grew up in this new social media age. You should be able to handle it better than Joe Sestak did. You know, I've gone back. I spent the last two years back at school also because I wanted to understand the issues better and I wanted to understand how to communicate them better. And, and then when I get there, if I ever were to, to be able to then say that what I did I'm willing to work on and hold me accountable if I don't. That's very important. That last part. Yeah, I think it's very tough, but that's just the way it is. Martin Luther, you know, of not Mar the Martin Luther who founded and was so successful as the monk in the Reformation against the Catholic Church, the reason he was so successful wasn't just because he was charismatic, not because he did grassroots, which he did, if you know his history, is because the printing press had just been discovered. 
So he was able to distribute his manifest against the Roman Catholic hierarchy and beat them at their game. This is just a new printing press. Figure it out. Yes, sir. Do you believe that the form of government that we have with a balance of power with the political parties that have emerged, do you feel they foster this? Yeah, it's a great question. Did everybody hear the question? Do I think, or do you think, that our type of government that we have actually created, that our forefathers placed in existence, actually is what is itself preventing this, is, is making this happen? Either preventing or fostering. Fostering it. The reason it's such a great question is I was I asked to go to Yale University to speak uh, to their ethical cl ethics class. And they have a course up there that is actually focused on this question. Can you still have the great man, so to speak, in a democracy? Because what our forefathers did so wisely, having looked at the French Revolution that was about to happen and kind of knowing that they'd seen revolutions in the past, I mean, it hadn't happened at that time, but they basically took strife off the streets and placed it in our government to where that's where the battles were going to be done with such checks and balances that they wanted to have. If you go back to Fellows Papers and others, they did not want the government interfering in our freedoms. And that's why the Articles of Confederation were so lousy. They didn't even have a central government. And then they saw, oh, we need something up there. And then they placed such checks and balances in it that that is actually many people stifling it. It's like Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, but it's better than anything else. So what we've done is, no, I don't think so in the longer term. When I worked at the White House for President Clinton, I walked out of that appreciating how hard it was to win a point, but how great it was that the democracy existed the way it did. Because the executive branch can get out of control. The Congress, left to its whim, can pass laws that could spend us into oblivion. So my take on it is that the rules that are implemented within the Congress, like the filibuster, like the Republican caucus that says you can't bring anything up unless the majority, the majority of the Republican caucus called a convention has it, is what really is preventing it. Then take money out of politics and you've solved 80% of your problem. Because people are very responsive that as you brought up, Fox Television is going to blare all over. And for the Democratic Party, the internet is about, this is what the guy said. And so therefore, all of a sudden, your funding stops for re-election. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking earlier about how to develop respect within groups who oppose you. And one of the things you said, just give them a chance to speak their mind. But how do you know like, where? How do you know like, when you've earned their respect by doing it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Sometimes they'll still disagree with you. Well, did you all hear the question? Um, I had mentioned, I think at dinner, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we'll at dinner that sometimes I felt that the other side, or people just want to um, have an opportunity to speak their mind. They don't necessarily expect you to always agree with them. Uh, and sometimes just by reaching out, it helps a lot. Uh, look, I'm not trying to make this a fairyland. I didn't expect the Republicans in my district on the whole to vote for me, but I expected, like I did the morning after my first election, that when I called the Republican leader at his home at about 8 o'clock in the morning after my first election in an upset to say, Charlie, do you mind if I come over for a cup of coffee, that after that pregnant pause, and he said, okay, that at least there would be some respect there, and I could at least work with him on maybe a principled compromise. That's what America does great. Everybody thinks the military is black and white. <laughs> it's anything but. You've got to earn those sailors' respect. They could turn that ship around on you on a dime. <laughs> They're so smart and good. Second, you've got to be able to compromise to some degree with people. And that's what we don't do. And, so the, and then be willing to take the heat from your own base on it. I mean, I make it sound simple, but it isn't. I know that. But I was opposed to the Iraq War. I thought it was a tragic misadventure. 
if for no other reason we divided our forces as we were fighting in Afghanistan, and the second wasn't a clear and a present danger to me. But the uh, Get Out of Iraq caucus in the Democrats said, I want out so fast, we'll cut off the funding in four months. Well, you know, when we had 18,000 soldiers in Somalia after Black Hawk Down, it took us six months to egress them out. Because if anybody knows in the military, it's easy to go in, rip in and just shoot away, but it's hard to back out where the ad series know you're going to be backing out. I couldn't agree with Democratic Caucus. People couldn't understand often in my district why I didn't vote for that. I said, because it's not practical. And you have to be willing to take that, I think, and all. So my take is that when I, as I told a story earlier, walked into the Republican cloakroom because I wanted to talk to a majority, to a Republican, Duncan Hunter, off the House floor, and everybody looked up at me, I didn't know you weren't allowed to walk into the Republican cloakroom, nor did I ever see in four years a Democrat, a Republican walk into the Democratic cloakroom. And my take is that, you know, I should be able to go in just like it's the chief's mess. And so that's, that's what I mean. I mean, but you've read the stories. Read Bob Woodward's book. I mean, the Republicans and Democrats certainly didn't talk on this sequester, did they? And yet, it's going to be a lot more harmful than it has to be because of it. Do you have any interest in going back into politics? And <laughs> what are your thoughts about term limits to solve some of the Yes. Um, do I have any interest in getting back into politics? Absolutely. If you can't be in the Navy, it's the next best thing I could do. <laughs> I loved it. I mean, how else could I come here and talk? You know, how else could I just pop into a penitentiary? They don't normally let anybody just go walking in a penitentiary. You know, when I was running against my party's desires, I got to over 200 places of congregations, places of faith, because my party in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh wouldn't let me in to talk to the party. So I had to go to the African American churches, and they welcomed me. I beat Governor Rendell, Mayor, then Mayor Rendell, in turnout in the black vote. <laughs> he told me himself, you know. It's a wonderful education. So, yes, I would like to. I intend to. I got to make sure it's the decision is right for which race. And term limits. Term limits. Um, since I'm older now, I could be. No. <laughs> <laughs> I always said when I can't run in a parade and shake hands and keep running, that's my term limit. But here's what I think. Before I do term limits, if you could take money and have public funding, you don't need term limits. Because, let me give you an example. Everybody keeps hearing a politician talk about small business. We gotta do this for small business. And part of the reason is 60% of all jobs are created by small businesses in their first three or four or five years of existence. The second reason is the majority of Americans work in a small business or own one. As a freshman congressperson, I got elected vice chairman of the Small Business Committee. You don't become a vice chairman until you've been in Congress 15 to 20 years. I thought it was because Congress wanted to demonstrate it had a sense of humor, but it wasn't. Nobody wants to go to small business because there's no PAC money for it. And so my take on this, if you take money out of politics and said, you get a million dollars, I get a million dollars, that person in office who isn't going to get the PAC money and, you know, and all this, and he's going to have to fight harder to do a good job because that guy here sitting at home is going to have a million dollars. That's what I would do. Barring that, I'd, probably, I'd be for term limits, probably three, two to three terms for senator and six to eight. The problem with term limits is this. The average age of my staff and most congression, uh, my staff was unusual. I loved youth. They're not burdened with experience. But the average age of most congressional member staff is probably 24, 25. They're there for one or two years, then they're moving on. And soon, you're having staff run the Congress. But it's gotten so bad that I think something different has to be done. But the concern is staff running the Congress. They run too much of it as it is because Congress members don't read the health care bill. Yes? Um, you talked a lot about accountability for uh, politicians in this country. But, um, you know, you saw in 2012, Pennsylvania, essentially, when they redrew the 
congressional map maps, it was in the incumbency protection program. And uh, I don't think any of those turned out, or I don't know. In California, you had a citizen commission to completely redraw the lines without any consideration as to where two congressmen would end up fighting against each other. And you saw a lot of incumbents lose. You saw a lot of new blood now in the congressional delegation of California. Would you support a law like California has a top two system of citizen commission? Absolutely. I think. It's not perfect, it's taking it out of the state legislators' hands, but I think in this case, you get much better fairness. Now, the Republicans drew those lines, but Democrats were in cahoots with them. If you notice, Democrats who had safe seats made them even safer. You know, there's a couple around the Philadelphia area that, you know, my, my district became even more Republican, you know? People who had 80% Democratic vote wanted 90%. So you can't blame either party. They're both you know, responsible for that. But I do think that can be done. That's how we did things on changing bases in the military. The military didn't want all these extra bases. They cost money. But no congressperson wants to close a base because it's money. So they create a commission. And then it comes to the legislature and they have an up or down vote. It's called a BRAC commission. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Just like term limits has to be because of, unfortunately, Citizens United and others. Yes, sir. We talked, we talked about eliminating money from politics. Well, I can't say it's going to be done because of the Constitution. My question was, given the current legal structure, yeah. how do you go about doing that? I, I, there is, you know, I had a bill for public financing of, of it, but there's no sponsors. Um, so unless somehow the composition of the Supreme Court changes, you know, significantly and there's better judicial studies, that's, that's the issue. The two most important decisions that a senator can make is the decision and the vote to go to war. And second is the vote for who is on the Supreme Court. I would argue that the judicial system in the United States of America from the Supreme Court all the way down to Commonwealth Courts and others, changes the character of America more in the long term than either the executive branch or the legislative branch. Because everything eventually goes to the court, whether it's Roe versus Wade, Citizens United, or Gore versus uh, Bush. Eventually, that institution changes it. To your point, it isn't just running for governor. It isn't just running for senator. It isn't just running to be a congressman, those state legislative positions, those mayor positions, those commonwealth positions, I give all credit to the Republican Party in Pennsylvania because they focus on those. They understand that that essentially is like a chief's mess under the enlisted. That's what kind of builds the structure upon which you can garner support for the bigger one. I can only take a couple more because, I, did the sign go up? Oh, oh no, it didn't, okay. so. She held up this sign that says boring. So, no. <laughs> Has Citizens United killed our democracy? I don't think Citizens United has killed our democracy. Do I think it's wrong? Yes, I do. But think about this. I mean, I've been in politics four years. I was in politics actually only three years when I decided to run for, when I was running for Senate. Because initially, you probably know the story they'd asked me to. I said no. Then they... I said yes, and then Senator Specter changed parties, and they said sit down, and I said I don't think so, and I ran. We came within two points, and yet we were outfunded with the biggest funding gap of any Senate, any governor's race in all of America, except for Meg Whitman's, who put her own corporation mo you know, earned money out there in California. If we had the biggest funding gap because of Citizens United, I mean, Karl Rove put millions of dollars in with eight days to go because I was up three, one to three points, it means it can be overcome. To your point again, I know it sounds idealistic to some degree, but I beat a 20-year incumbent Republican and then a senator, and then we came this close despite it. So it can be overcome. This Fox question was brilliant. Let me tell you, I've got a young man who's working for me for the last two years figuring out the perfect social media thing. I'm going to out Obama Obama, you know? <laughs> it just, you know, successful generals win, then they go to war. 
It just means you have to think it through if that's what you choose to do. Not just run, but I hope whether you go into the private industry in Wall Street, or whether you become a union leader, whatever it is, be accountable for their ultimate mission. Wall Street's accountable not for making wealth, they're supposed to provide capital for investment. Labor isn't supposed to be accountable to unions, it's supposed to be accountable to working families. And I think we tend to forget the mission upon which the organizations are set up, and so do the parties. It's about incumbency rather than the people. So when Ed Rendell said I was going to get killed, nobody was listening because you know, the people tend to get forgotten. Uh, was that one last one? Yes. Okay, um, regarding today's leadership, do you believe that they're afraid to be held accountable because they're afraid of the repercussions from their constituents or because they're afraid of their peers? No, I think they are very worried about political survivability and losing their job. There's very, you know, if you go against leadership, I mean, I've often said the Democratic cause is the least Democratic place I've ever been. You know, because the Speaker is really not the Speaker of the House, it's the Speaker of the caucus. And if you kind of don't go along, you're not going to get a good committee assignment, okay? But that's different. Losing your job for someone who has started 30 years old and thinks they're going to be President of the United States, or someone who, you know, can go, you know, is very challenging. And so I think that is the major issue uh, upon it. I will end with um, two things. Um, I'll never forget as we came out a few weeks later on that time I told you we were in the caucus and the first four members got up and says, don't touch it. They made it happen. We just don't want to own and be held accountable. About two weeks later, we voted on the bill. It was the bill to salvage the banking system. And it failed that night. About, in the voting on the House floor, it's sort of like, you know, when you're watching a horse race, you can kind of tell when the horse is going to win. And so you're watching the electronic counting up there, and just about the time you say, oh, this bill's not going to make it. Someone came out on the House floor and called out, the market's down 700 points. <laughs> and you can almost see congressional members wanting to go back and change their vote. I mean, there were some who didn't want to do it because of substance. They really didn't believe it was the right thing. On the whole, you knew that they just wanted to change it, but didn't dare because of it. I came home to my district that, to that vote because we didn't have Congress the next day. I was supposed to go on television two times. I ended up going on 13 times. And as I left at about 11.30 p.m., Fox 29, in Philadelphia, they said, hey, do you mind coming in at 6 in the morning to come on again? I said, oh, I'd love to. I mean, to me, this is fantastic. I get a great chance to say why I voted the way I did. Well, the next day, the vice president was there and said, I just want to thank you for coming on. We couldn't get any other congressional members in the entire Philadelphia region. <laughs> come on. <laughs> now, you've got to remember, it was easy for me. I had a career. It was the Navy. This was a payback tour for passion. So I had it a little easier than others. But overall, when it was all over, and the next morning I had gone out down to West Philadelphia, guns shaking hands, thank first the African American community because they've been my best demographic, and then began to go back to all the 67 counties to thank people. I was then asked to write an article about the Arab Spring. And it was the Mediterranean Journal asked me to write it. And I said, I'm happy to write it. They'd come to me because I'd been a military officer. I deployed out in that area. I had you know, worked at the NSC and had a little bit of policy background. Shows you can fool anybody. But I said, I will write about it, but I'll only write about it, if you don't mind, from the perspective not as military officer nor as a uh, policy guy, but as what can it tell us through the prism of a politician here in America? And to my point of view is, when that street peddler in Tunisia set himself on fire and set the Middle East ablaze, he was doing it for the same reason we established our revolution. <laughs> we were pretty upset, as he was, 
of rulers taking the fruits of our labor unfairly. The police were taking his fruits, literally fruits, and of course we were losing through taxation and others and, and all. And what had really happened is the people had lost trust in a leadership that was more concerned about itself and survival and extenuating it than they were about the people. I think it's a great lesson for us. Not that we will ever explode into another revolution, but worse than that is we could lose this generation as sitting in the seats today. If you all do not get engaged, we cannot change it. If anybody thinks success in Washington is at its highest ever today, it isn't. <laughs> we need you. I came today because I feel very strongly that this is readily repairable. To your question, it just takes a few titans. You know, it takes some smarts. It takes the ability to understand that you can't be Don Quixote. People like Don Quixote, but they want him on a stage. They don't want him in real life, but they want the ideals that Don Quixote stands for to somehow break through in real life. I think we've been let down too often. It's just not intentions or hope, it's actually deeds that matter. It sure matters out there when life is on the line. But it matters here, and that's how I felt as a captain of a ship. But it matters here at home because it now, I felt, had to do with livelihoods. And they, in the longer term, for America, really is what most matters. And so that's why I believe, I have great, great faith, having seen them in the youth of America, to do what has to be done in this issue of accountable leadership. Yes, leadership, but the accountability is the basis upon which you gain the trust to lead. I thank you for listening to me very much.